Come with us now on a journey through time and space. To the world of the mighty boom. coming your way shortly. Let's just take a look at the weather for the capital cities before we get there, though. We'll start in Brisbane, a mostly sunny Monday for you, with a forecast top of 23. It's 9 now. In Sydney, a shower or 2 and 17, currently 10. For Canberra, partly cloudy, a top of 12 in the national capital today. It's 3 now. In Melbourne, cloudy and 13, currently 6. For Hobart, a partly cloudy day with a top of 11, 4 now in Tassie. For Adelaide, partly cloudy and 15, 5 at the moment. In Perth, a possible shower today in the west, a forecast top of 22. It's 9 now, and for Darwin, cloudy and 31, currently 25 degrees. Australian Eastern Standard Time is half past 7. It's 7 o'clock in the centre and half past 5 in the west. the latest news headlines and a very good morning to Sarah Hall. Good morning. Thanks, Tom. US President Joe Biden has announced the launch of a global infrastructure partnership designed to counter China's influence in the developing world. The initiative aims to leverage more than $800 billion alongside fellow governments and corporations of the G7 leading economies by 2027. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese will arrive in Europe later today for a NATO summit dominated by the war in Ukraine. Leaders from NATO nations and key partners such as Australia are gathering in Spain to discuss challenges facing the alliance, including the effects on global security from Russia's military invasion. The United States is set to re-examine Boeing's production of its 737 MAX aircraft with an ABC investigation revealing the plane has experienced six mid-air emergencies since being cleared to return to the air. 346 people were killed in two crashes involving the plane in 2018 and 2019, prompting all MAX aircraft around the world to be grounded while a safety review was conducted. New South Wales beekeepers say emergency measures to stop the spread of a deadly parasite will be devastating to the industry. Overnight, all movements of bees within New South Wales have been halted due to concerns about the detection of the Varroa mite in hives at the port of Newcastle on Friday. Hives within a 10-kilometre radius of the port were also been destroyed. ACT Senator David Pocock has criticised the federal government's decision to reduce advisory staff of crossbench MPs and senators. In a letter to 12 lower house and six Senate crossbenchers, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese proposed cutting the number of parliamentary staff they can employ from four to one. Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews' new look ministry is set to be sworn in today after four senior ministers resigned last week. Jacinta Allen will take over as Deputy Premier in the reshuffled team, while five new MPs have been elevated and several portfolios shifted. An 18-year-old man will appear in court today to be the murder of another teenager on the New South Wales North Coast over the weekend. Industrial action by train drivers is expected to cause significant delays for commuters across New South Wales this week. The Rail, Tram and Bus Union says drivers will reduce the speed of trains from tomorrow and peak hour services will be cut by up to 75%. And Tom, former Beatle Paul McCartney has wowed fans at the UK's Glastonbury Festival two years after he was originally slated to headline the event. The veteran singer played a two and a half hour set, making history as the festival's oldest solo headliner at age 80. I'll be back with more in half an hour. You still got it. I wish I was there. Sarah Hall, thank you very much. It's Monday the 27th of June. You're listening to ABC News Radio. Cerisi making news hundreds of billions of dollars. The world's richest industrialised nation set to mount a huge investment program to rival China's Belt and Road Initiative. Also today, it's important that democratic nations stand with Ukraine. 
And that's the context of this NATO summit. The Prime Minister Anthony Albanese flies to Europe for a NATO summit dominated by concerns over Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And in lockdown, there's a ban on moving bees in New South Wales after the discovery of a destructive mite. Yeah. 
like California, for example, that have some of the strongest abortion protections in place, they say that they now will turn their attention uh, to trying to get those laws wound back. While uh, people on the other side of the argument, people who uh, want to see the constitutional right to an abortion returned, uh, they say that they will keep fighting for that. But really now their effort also turns uh, to the states into uh, trying uh, to see as many states uh, keep protections in place as possible and also looking at how they might be able to still support women. So trying to provide assistance to women who are in a state where abortion has been banned, trying to give them the help that they need so that they could travel to another one. Okay, Jane, thank you very much for joining us. North America correspondent Jane McMillan there. Uh, joining us from the US state of Oklahoma, of course, uh, in the wake of that decision by the Supreme Court to overturn Roe versus Wade. Oklahoma, very much an interesting uh, case study there. The toughest abortion laws in the country. Uh, this trigger law already being enforced. And as we're hearing, there are a number of states already quickly uh, moving to ban abortion in the wake of that ruling. Anti-abortion campaign is hoping to get the procedure outlawed in as much of the country as possible. But uh, also those who are outraged by the court's ruling trying to uh, figure out a ways around those bans. So, of course, the story will continue to follow closely. Uh, let's uh, turn to uh, some other news now. It's a remarkable statistic that underscores the urgency of addressing gender equality in the workforce. Research out this morning shows that across all generations, fewer than 50% of women are working full-time and missing out on management roles while pay parity with men remains pretty elusive. For the first time, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency has broken down the gender pay gap by age and shows that men out-earn women across all age groups. The ABC senior business correspondent Peter Ryan has been going through the report and he joins us now. Peter, good morning to you. Good morning, Tom. The report has some pretty stark figures when it comes to the gender age gap and there's a pretty long way to go in fixing that, it seems. Yeah, that's right, Tom. Uh, the, the big one, as you mentioned, is that at every age and every stage of their working lives, the majority of women aren't working full-time, something that's quite remarkable given uh, the uh, reported, reported gains in recent years in improving the gender pay gap. It's not just because of maternity leave and cutting back on um, work to spend more time at home, but that workplaces, CEOs and boards appear to have a very long way to go in making it possible for women to work full-time with more flexible work practices. So getting beyond policies on the shelf into tangible action. And all of this is cumulative. The report shows that men earn more than women at every level, uh, peaking in the age group of 55 to 64, where men out-earn women by 32% for an average $40,000 a year. And even women who become chief executives take home around $93,000 less than their male counterparts. The trend continues. Millennium women in the workplace will earn just 70% of, of men's earnings by the time.
through 7 p.m. on um, Saturdays on the Triple Y. represents or reflects society with most of its members coming from a business background some critics think there should be more economists but others want to see unions taking a seat uh, way back trade union officials like bob hawke before he was prime minister and bill kelty a former actu secretary were on the rba board now jim chalmers was on insiders yesterday and he was asked if he thought Union officials, for example, ACTU Secretary Sally McManus should be board members, and he said he had an open mind and appeared to cautiously welcome the suggestion. Oh, look, I've got an open mind uh, to making the board more representative. That's one of the focuses I want from this Reserve Bank review. It wouldn't be unprecedented uh, to have somebody from uh, that side of the of the conversation represented on the board. Uh, on a case-by-case -case basis, I, I do have an open mind to making sure that workers are represented, but this is one of the things that I want the Reserve Bank uh, review to have. What about Sally McManus uh, herself, uh, former uh, Reserve Bank boss? Bernie Fraser says it would be bloody great to have someone like Sally McManus on the board rather than some academic pontificating on things. Would Sally McManus make a good board member? Oh, I'm not going to get into that, David. I mean, obviously, I've got a lot of respect for Sally. I work closely with her. But these decisions about board appointments are cabinet decisions. Uh, there are uh, a couple of uh, appointments to be that made between now and when the Reserve Bank review would report towards the middle of next year. I'll have those conversations behind the scenes, uh, and I'm not going to preempt any of those decisions. To Treasurer Jim Chambers speaking on Insiders yesterday, and before that, we were joined by the ABC senior business correspondent Peter Ryan. This is ABC. News Radio across Australia. Thanks for joining us this morning. It's Monday the 27th of June, Eastern Standard Time, 13 minutes to 8. It's 17 past 7 in the centre and 13 to 6 in the west. I'm Thomas Ariti making news. G7 leaders agree to invest billions of dollars in global infrastructure to help developing countries and to bolster the world economy. It's a pledge that came on the first day of their annual summit. It's been hosted by Germany also today. These mines can get into wild populations as well, so it's absolutely critical that we nail it before it uh, goes too far. The movement of bees banned across New South Wales after the detection of this parasite at the port of Newcastle. We'll have more on that throughout the morning and what this moment marks is that space in australia and astronomy it didn't start yesterday this is something that's been working on for 60,000 years australia's launched its first commercial space rocket in the arnhem land region of the northern territory more on that in just a moment <laughs> take a closer look. It's NASA. They've successfully launched a rocket from the Northern Territory out back overnight. It's an Australian first. Four, three, two, one. Yeah! <laughs> it's pretty exciting stuff. And uh, there it goes. Suborbital, a suborbital sounding rocket blasting off into space with the goal of helping scientists explore how a star's light can influence a planet's habitability. It was the first of three launches that'll take place at the Arnhem Space Center uh, near Nullamboy, which is in northeast Arnhem land. And for more on this, we're joined now by Michael Jones, CEO of Equatorial Launch Australia, which operates the Arnhem Space Center. Michael, good morning to you. Yeah, good morning. How are you doing? Not too bad. Uh, exciting uh, morning. I understand some gusty winds delayed the launch, though. Is that right? Yeah, it was, um, the wind was sort of swirling over the top of the, the launch pads on the end of the sort of a bit of a rock peninsula and the wind was swirling around. So um, in the very in the initial stages of launch, the rocket is in its most vulnerable um, you know, sort of state for winds affecting its trajectory. So we have a set of criteria and we just had to wait until the wind sort of stabilised and um, it was swirling and sort of going up and down a little bit. And um, yeah, so it, it, it made the delay, but uh, but we eventually uh, got off, which was fantastic. And I played a, a bit of a sound snippet there at the beginning, uh, but what was the atmosphere like on the ground once that rocket launched? A lot of excitement, I imagine. 
Yeah, so we had engaged a team of uh, media guys and Brad there, who's a, a science presenter, you know, he's incredibly enthusiastic and he held the board for ages. So he added, you know, to the excitement of getting everybody hyped up. This is Brad Tucker, um, as you heard. Yeah, yeah I could imagine he was fantastic. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, throughout the night, you know, the uh, we had quite a few sort of dignitaries and, you know, locals and other VIPs, etc. And so there was a bit of waiting around, but we had a good night. Um, and then uh, sort of everybody was, you know, like glad that we got, got the launch in. It was a successful launch. Um, so far, the initial indications of the science data are that we got great data out of it. So in the end of the day, the customer's happy and that uh, sort of makes us happy too. So, so I mean, you see, you've already got data out of this well, it's just how is it going to work? So I, I, I would have thought it would have been a bit of a process, but it, we're, we're hearing about, you know, this idea of exploring... It, it is a bit of... Uh, yeah, exploring how a star's light can influence a planet's habitability. What, what data have you got already? Yeah, so my very rudimentary understanding is that um, we had good data stream, which we sort of to make sure that the payload is operating as per, you know, the, the mission parameters. Uh -huh. And they got good solid data streaming to say that the, the X-ray telescope um, coming out of the um, end of the rocket um, as the payload was sort of you know, free to do its job. Apparently it did its job, um, it, it acquired the targets, um, it recorded the data and so the recovery team sort of sprang into action straight away to work out where it is to devise a um, search and recovery pattern. We've coordinated with local traditional owners whose land it, it landed on so we can go back and recover the payload now and uh, and extract the real data out of it and the scientists you know uh, Dan McAdaman whose uh, mission it was from University of Wisconsin he'll take the data back analyze it and I'm sure we'll hear the results at some stage in a scientific paper how hard so something's already sorry for my naive questions here so something's already fallen back down to earth with that data captured in it and it's a matter of going and finding it and extracting the data from that device yeah that's right so the rocket launches goes up into space the engine cuts out um, when it's at about 150 to 170 kilometers into space and because it's going so fast it continues on its um, parabolic trajectory um, reaching what they call apogee or the top of that parabola um, you know at about 315 kilometers into space um, they have a, a shutter door on the front of the, um, the rocket the nose cone separates the shutter door opens um, the um, x-ray camera and the sensitive payload which is about 450 kilos of really sensitive scientific data um, does its thing and then um, basically the rocket is then uh, retarded in speed so that it returns to Earth um, on a planned schedule. And the nose cone and the secondary motor fall um, almost in formation with the payload, um, re-enter the atmosphere and then
trillion dollars, a major step in attempts to counter China's influence overnight. The world's richest industrialized nations are set to mount a huge investment program to rival China's Belt and Road Initiative. Also today, because the current system puts it on the renter to enforce their rights, it doesn't always work out that the landlord will comply with their obligations. New research shows renters are facing challenges, including lengthy delays when it comes to having repairs done at their properties. And as we just heard... It will be devastating for them just from losing those farms, but it's also going to be the emotional impact on these people as well. It's the Australian Honeybee Industry Council. It says, on top of what we heard from Glenn there, it's welcoming any aid from the government after the detection of a deadly bee parasite. Glenn also touched on this uh, a minute ago, just uh, the natural disasters his region seen. But just think back, the Black Summer bushfires tore through more than 24 million hectares, directly causing the deaths of 33 people, nearly 450 more from smoke inhalation. Before recovery could really begin, COVID caused a global pandemic, locked down Australian communities, isolating many for weeks, sometimes months at a time. And then just this year, many of the same areas impacted by fires were inundated by flooding during months of record rain. But the immense pressure Australia to be under will leave its mark for years to come. And for some, that will be through post-traumatic stress disorder. Well, today is PTSD Awareness Day. We're joined now by the Director of Disaster and Public Health Emergencies at Phoenix Australia Centre for Post-Traumatic Mental Health, Alexandra Howe. Alex, good morning and thank you for your time. Good morning, thank you. Who can be affected by the trauma of a natural disaster? We're not just talking necessarily about um, the not um, talking this down, not necessarily somebody's lost a home, but there's so many people involved in you know, rescue recovery efforts back on the front line as well. That's exactly right. Really, anyone in the community can be impacted by the disaster. And as you say, it's not just can't be measured by the property losses or, or anything like that. So there is a real ripple effect through communities and also those frontline workers, as you say, that have come in to help those communities as well can be impacted by the trauma. I imagine it can differ in terms of its severity as well. Yeah, so, well, I guess the relatively good news is that after a disaster, we know that most people do recover by drawing on their support systems by drawing on their natural coping strategies uh, but there is a significant group of people who do go on to develop mental health disorder including PTSD and these can emerge even five or more years after the, the disaster so it's something that recording three channels started
and place a part of the government so they understand what they're doing. This is a public health service. But the, the, you know, a lot of people wonder, saying, oh, you give me a green light to go and get from here. You know, certain politicians and premiers of the past say things like that. That's not what we're doing. It, it, the best analogy I can give to you and the listeners is that, you know, we tell people, you know, that it's dangerous to drive fast or speed in your motor vehicle. But we wouldn't say to people, okay, we've told you not to speed, so we're going to remove the seatbelts from your car, do you know, because we've told you not to do that. And what we, you know, you can say and have a message of, you know, it's dangerous to use drugs, don't use drugs. But the reality is people do use drugs. And if you talk to parents who have lost kids and have faced that never-ending grief, then I think it's pretty hard to say to them, oh, well, we told them not to do it, you know, when we know that people are doing it. And so what our, what our policy, our principles, one of our core principles is to engage with people. We don't judge them. We're not going to condemn them. We're not going to condone what they do, but we're going to engage with them and make sure that they actually know what they're doing and that they make good choices for themselves. It's part of a six-month trial, uh, Gino. Has there been any opposition from the community? Surprise, or maybe not surprisingly, but there's been widespread support for this. We actually um, did some polling, um, and there's been other polls that have run, and there's a really high level of community support for pill testing. You know, we haven't seen the political support for that, but that's, you know, part of the course sometimes with these sort of issues that, you know, the public is way ahead of the political representatives, and I think people just understand that, you know, as much as we may not want our kids to take drugs or people we know to take drugs, it happens, you know, for a variety of reasons. And so the best thing is that if they do that, that they don't end up in a hospital bed or, or worse, you know, as a result of that. And the only way we can do that is by talking to people and helping them and letting them understand what it is they're taking and making sure that if something goes wrong, they're aware of what to do. And in the end, you can't, you know, when you talk to parents who've lost kids, you can't turn that back. You, know, you can't turn that around. It's too late. We're out of time, we're afraid, Gita, but thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Gita Vabaka there, President of Harm Reduction Australia. So Canberra uh, going to be the first Australian city to get a fixed pill testing site. It's part of a six-month trial. We'll be operating uh, from the week of the 18th of July, operating at this stage two nights a week on Thursdays and Fridays. Australia now, Qatar Airways has announced extra flights into Adelaide from Doha and Auckland to keep pace with the growing post-COVID demand. Our reporter Charles Bryce is in Adelaide this morning. Seems like everyone is itching to get on a plane and travel the world once again. And to keep up with that demand, we are going to be seeing more international flights arriving into South Australia. Qatar Airways have announced that they'll be making an additional two flights into Adelaide per week. Uh, that will take the flight from uh, Doha to Adelaide and to Auckland. That will mean that that will now operate uh, five times a week. That's uh, going to benefit those people who are wanting to go to the Middle East or further on to Europe or across the ditch into New Zealand. Uh, it's uh, going to be a perfect time as well to escape the depths of winter or to get onto the ski slopes in New Zealand. It's also going to be hugely beneficial for the tourism industry here in South Australia. Uh, we know have been doing it tough for a number of years. It does seem to be on the, the rebound though. In fact, the uh, total uh, the visitor expenditure in March was 84% of pre-pandemic levels. The airport here this morning has been quite busy and it has been the case for airports right around the country. And that's because domestic flights are now exceeding uh, pre-pandemic levels as well. So it's great to see a bit of normalcy coming back into our lives. Charles Bryce reporting there from Adelaide this morning. The massive interest rate Work is 25% increase in infectious. Keep across the news that matters to you with the ABC Listen app. Get up to the minute local, national and world news. Live and on demand. Western NATO officials believe in-depth investigations from ABC podcasts. Like Triple J's hack, ABC News Daily and many more. All the news that matters to you. With the ABC Listen app. And good morning to those listening to us live on the ABC Listen app this morning. It's time now for sport. Jared Coote, good morning to you. Queensland, sounds like they're still pretty confident heading into game three at the State of Origin despite that big loss last night to the Blues. Yeah, they certainly are, Tom, or at least they say they are. Queensland State of Origin coach Billy Slater 
Santos is proud of his side's effort uh, in last night's 44-12 loss to the Blues in Game 2 in Perth. The Maroons trailed at halftime 14-12 with Felice Cafusi being sin-bin just before the break for repeated infringements. The Blues ran away with the game in the second half, scoring five tries to level the scores. The series, rather, at one game apiece. Uh, Slater says his side can still win the decider at home next month if they put in one of their better performances for the state. I think Queensland will be proud of their team. They put in a whole heap of effort. It's one all in the series. You know, the series will go back to Brisbane. That's not going to win us the game. That's not going to help us. But they tried really hard. You can't fault their effort. Queensland's always been about effort. So they'll stick together, Queensland. OK, Minji Lee, a champion to us all, of course, but so close to winning another major this morning. One Quite. shot away, Tom. Just one shot from making it two. Uh, in a row, still was another incredible performance. She believes she is at least close to being the best player in the world after almost winning the Women's PGA this morning. The 26-year-old finished just one shot back from uh, the winner, Inji Chun, after five birdies in 14 holes and a strong performance that follows her US Open victory earlier this month. She's currently ranked third in the world time, but she was asked uh, after the tournament whether she feels like she is currently the best player in the world. I think I'm contending. <laughs> you know, I still want to be humble, stay humble, but I I want to think that I'm hard to beat right now. That's the opposite response you'd get from a boxer, Tom. Yeah, was, uh, I'm the best in the world. Yeah, if you're, if you're number 100. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, good to see. You. And, uh, yeah, she'll be uh, right in the mix in uh, the next women's major, which actually gets underway in just a few weeks' time. Uh, as well. There is five majors on the women's tour as opposed to the four uh, for the men's. Meanwhile, speaking of the men's golf tour, American golfer Xander Shoffley has won the Travelers Championship in Connecticut by two shots after a dramatic final round. Rookie Sahif Bigala had the lead until bunker trouble at the last led to a double bogey and dropped him back to second position. It's a golfer's nightmare that. Cam Davis was the best of the Australians. 17 shots uh, back from the winner. Road to Wimbledon. Novak Djokovic says he's inspired heading into it. Yeah, he does uh, say that. You'd imagine he's inspired uh, every time he plays, but uh, stepped up a notch after uh, this uh, tournament. The three-time US Open champion says he's banned from entering America due to his refusal to take the COVID vaccine. Only serves as extra motivation to win the Wimbledon title, which gets underway later tonight. The top-seeded serve was also barred, of course, from entering Australia to play in the Australian Open, with the government saying his presence in Australia could stir anti-vaccination sentiment. Djokovic says, with no indication that the US authorities will relax their travel ban for the unvaccinated, Wimbledon could be his final major tournament for 2022. Yes, of course, I'm aware of that, and that is um, an extra motivation to do well here. So hopefully I can have... Um, a very good tournament as I have done uh, in the last three editions. Novak Djokovic speaking there. So as for the tournament, it does get underway tonight. A couple of Australians in action. Max uh, Purcell will be taken to the court. Tanasi Kokonakis as will John Millman in the women's singles tonight. Uh, just the one uh, player taking to the court, Madison Inglis will uh, hit the court later on tonight. And, uh, yeah, an exciting, exciting tournament. A lot of eyes on Nick Kyrgios as well, given uh, his strong form yeah. in the build-up to the tournament as well, Tom. well. I couldn't agree more. Just to, to the AFL, well, I've got you there. Port Adelaide, a step closer to reaching the top eight. Yeah, they certainly are. They're in the running to make the finals after a two-point win over the Suns at Adelaide Oval uh, yesterday. They won 93-91. to They've won seven games this season. They're just one win and a bit of percentage outside the top eight in the other games yesterday. Collingwood beat the Giants by 11 and the Crows had a big win over North Melbourne. Thank you very much for joining us. Jared Coote there back in half an hour with more sport on ABC News Radio. Let's take a look at the financial markets. The SPY 200 is in positive territory this morning. It's up 1.6% or 103 points. In futures trade, it comes after some solid gains on Wall Street over the weekend. The Nasdaq is up 3.3% to 11,607. The S&P 500 and the Dow Jones uh, all finished solidly higher as well over the weekend. The Aussie dollar, 69.5 US cents. Five minutes of news coming your way shortly. Let's take a look at the weather for the capital cities before we get there, though. We'll start in Brisbane. Sunshine for you this Monday.
with a forecast top of 23 at 16 now. In Sydney, a shower or two in 17. 12 at the moment. For Canberra, partly cloudy with a top of 12 at 7 now in the national capital. In Melbourne, partly cloudy in 13, currently 8. For Hobart, partly cloudy, a top of 11 at 6 now in Tassie. And what do you know, partly cloudy for Adelaide as well, a top of 15, currently 8 in SA. For Perth, a possible shower today, 22 the top in the west, it's currently 10. And for Darwin, a cloudy day ahead, 31 the top this Monday, it is 25 now. It's time now for five minutes of news. Australian Eastern Standard Time is half past nine. It's nine o'clock in the centre. Good morning in the west, it's half past seven. Sarah Hall with ABC News. Ukraine's foreign minister has called on G7 leaders to provide more heavy weapons for his country and place more sanctions on Russia following the latest missile strike on Kyiv. As the BBC's Nick Beek reports, at least 14 missiles have hit the city in the most sustained such barrage in months. Once again, Ukraine's capital is under attack. And once again, civilians are in the firing line. An ammunition factory nearby could have been the intended target here. But the head of Ukrainian police, Ihor Klimenko, said this was a possible war crime. Kyiv is far from the fierce fighting that's raging in Donbass, in the east of Ukraine. But Russia, when it chooses, continues to attack this capital city. ACT Senator David Pocock says it's clear the Prime Minister won't budge on his decision to reduce the advisory staff of crossbench MPs and Senators. Anthony Albanese has defended his proposal to cut the number of parliamentary staff of crossbenchers, who are now accusing the government of attempting to reduce their influence in the new parliament. Senator Pocock says he's concerned the reduction in resources will prevent crossbenchers from being able to properly examine and seek to improve legislation. We've heard uh, Senator Gallagher talk about uh, being the shadow finance minister with three staff and how hard it was just covering one portfolio area with, with those three staff. As independent senator, it has to be across all portfolios. New South Wales has recorded another 11 deaths and 6,862 new COVID cases. There are 1,507 people in hospital with coronavirus, including 55 in intensive care. While Victoria has reported one new COVID-related death and 6,305 cases, there are 459 people in hospital after contracting the virus. Of those, 26 patients are in ICU and 10 are receiving ventilation. The number of South Australians being reinfected with COVID-19 is rising. SA Health has so far reported 2,930 COVID reinfections, which is 900 more than three weeks ago. That number counts people who have caught COVID again more than 12 weeks apart. Epidemiologist Professor Adrian Esterman says there's likely many more cases that are going unreported. I think it's probably a gross underestimate. And I say that because we don't even know how many people have been infected in the first place, let like, alone reinfected. And that's because there's a high percentage of people who have had no symptoms at all, never get tested, never come to the authorities' notice. The Victorian government's revamped ministry will be sworn in this afternoon after Labor's caucus voted in a new team over the weekend. With more, here's Isabella Tolhurst. Jacinta Allen will become Deputy Premier today following the mass exodus of senior ministers from Andrews' front bench last Friday. On Saturday, the caucus endorsed Daniel Andrews' pick for deputy, along with five other new MPs who have been promoted to ministerial roles. It gives the Andrews cabinet a new look ahead of the state election in November. Some of the changes include Colin Brooks heading up child protection and disability, Sonia Kilkenny takes on corrections, and Lizzie Blanthorne will become planning minister. The new cabinet, which is now more than 50% women, will be sworn in at government house this afternoon. A women's reproductive health expert says even though abortion has been widely decriminalised in Australia, it's still regulated very differently from other medical procedures. La Trobe University's Erica Miller says the stigma of the procedure means only a small number of doctors are registered to perform it. Dr Miller says within medical institutions, moral danger has been misrepresented as clinical danger. Abortion is always safer than continuing with a pregnancy and birth, which are more risky than abortion, regardless of the gestational stage in which the abortion occurs. 
Train commuters in New South Wales are being warned to brace for significant delays this week. The rail, tram and bus union says drivers will reduce the speed of train...